Dude, we pulled it off. We got it on time. It happened. We didn't have a password reset issue. Everything was smooth. Excited to see you, sir. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Andrew. Andrew, last Hello. time we did this, we had a password reset issue. And oh. I, I was like 10 minutes late to the stream. Yeah, the irony of password resets in our lives is is uh, never ending. And uh, eventually yeah. that will go away. Yeah, it will. I, I have faith. I, I've made it my life's mission. I just, yes. I thought about it recently. This is the longest job I've ever had. And it's probably been the singular, like most career wise focused thing I've ever done. Yeah. Which is weird to think about. Um, and so, you know, hopefully, hopefully uh, the legacy will be a positive one. I, I think it will. But yeah, we're, we're grateful for that. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so yeah, quick intros. Thank you all for joining in. Uh, Boyan here with my co-host Ryan. Um, and we have a special guest today, Mr. Andrew Shikyar, uh, who is the CEO of the Fido Alliance. Thanks for having me. It's always good to, always good to chat with you guys. Yeah. And, and we're here to, um, to drive some momentum, shine some light on some of the recent statistics around phishing attacks and the importance of pass keys and also super important uh, announcement regarding the Authenticate conference, uh, which is in a sh few short weeks. So Andrew, do you want to give a quick pitch on Authenticate? Uh, because it is an amazing conference and the location is probably my favorite location <laughs> I've ever been to of any conference ever. So give it the quick pitch. I, I love hearing that. Um, so yeah, Authenticate is FIDO's annual conference uh, where people can come learn the ins and outs of all, thing, all things authentication, obviously a, a very close focus on, on FIDO and, and, and pass keys. Um, this is the second year in a row that we've held it at the beautiful La Costa Resort and Spa in Carlsbad, California. Um, so a little bit north of San Diego or a little south of Orange County, depending where you fly to. Um, it's a wonderful place to um, hang out with a bunch of authentication identity nerds, um, which is which is awesome. Um, it's, it's a beautiful venue, but really, most importantly, it's, it's a great conference. Um, we've, we've grown this over the years uh, from just an idea of, of kind of expanding what we used to do with one-day seminars into a, a multi-day event. Um, this is now a... a, a three-day event um, where we also have the um, our member plenary, our member meeting happens, plus an added day on Thursday for the members. Um, but the content's fantastic. And we have a program committee who whittled through, I think, you know, hundreds of submissions to speak and narrowed it down to something around 70 or 80 different sessions spread over three days. Um, registration is looking great. We're up around 30% from last year. So... I think anyone who's coming in person can expect to be surrounded by, you know, 650 ish people um, from all walks of life, from all industries with a common focus of learning how to um, move beyond passwords. You know, one last note on this, um, you know, it's not just for the FIDO pros. Um, so, you know, one of the questions we ask all registrants, how much do you know about FIDO? Are you new to it? And um, each year we have around 30% of people who are kind of new to this, which is awesome. So whether you are a FIDO newbie or a FIDO pro, um, you know, please be sure to come to Carlsbad, California for Authenticate. Yeah, I remember uh, when you when we were there last year and you asked the audience, like, how many are, you know, first timers? And it was 70% of the room. It, yeah. was, it was a huge number of first timers, people learning. So it was it was amazing to see. And uh, I'm really looking forward to our time at Carlsbad together. Yeah, it's, it's going to be great. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, with that, let's jump into the topic of the session. So today we'll be talking about combating the 856% increase in phishing incidents, uh, specifically with pass keys. And so we'll talk today about, you know, some of the questions that we, we've received over the last few days and weeks uh, around this topic in particular. Uh, actually, much of the hyper team was in Vegas last week at the Falcon conference, which uh, CrowdStrike puts on every year. And uh, the, the interest in identity was just overwhelming. And so I think there's this massive convergence right now happening between uh, identity and cybersecurity. 
on the enterprise side and also a massive convergence happening with identity and fraud on the consumer side. And so it's really exciting. I think the broader folks, folks in the ecosystem are starting to realize that, hey, identity is the perimeter. It's probably the most important thing that we can focus on right now to secure our users. And today we're going to spend our half hour talking about much of that. So let's jump into it. I was, I was going to expand on that because it is very much true from what I saw when I was there last week was how much identity was coming back to the the top of mind for most of these individuals who attended this conference are, are really more endpoint EDR, yeah. you know, looking at threat data and the, the next gen sim stuff that they have coming out from, from CrowdStrike, but everything kept coming back. As, as some of us have always known, identity is that security function and it, it you can start seeing it. it is now resonating more and more. So that was pretty exciting to see. Um, there's a lot of buzz, a lot of energy. I'm, I'm happy to uh, have been exhausted over those four days uh, of hanging out with everybody there and, and seeing that FIDO is coming up more and more. Right. So everybody will advocate for MFA, but now we're basically saying, but why, if you haven't done MFA, why would you do that? Just go to FIDO, right? Just go to passkeys. Passkeys make sense. Not not RSA hard tokens and soft tokens. <laughs> well, sorry, didn't mean to take a shot at you, RSA, but it's a little annotated. Um, RSA hard tokens in general. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there's plenty of <laughs> vendors out there who provide them. <laughs> yeah, well, as, as we know, I mean, hard like you know, FIDO security keys are the gold standard from a security standpoint for FIDO authentication. But I, I think the key thing you're hitting on there is, um, I. I you know, I, I think our dialogue for so long has been about factors. Um, and that's really the wrong dialogue to have, right? Not how many factors, but why don't we look at the primary factor? And, and at the end of the day, all these layers we're trying to layer on top of passwords are all things we do to make passwords suck less. And, and that's really not possible um, because they're fundamentally flawed. And so with passkeys now, right, you have a primary factor that is inherently unfishable. Um, and the biggest threat out there today is phishing and you see this i mean i i don't understand this data you're showing me here um at 40 41 4, 150 i can't even say 4100 percent increase in in malicious emails over the past couple of years that's staggering right well, and, and that and that's that's taking advantage of this ongoing dependence we have on a um, fundamentally flawed primary factor of authentication of passwords um, yeah take that out of the equation things get better I think this number is inclusive of all malicious type of emails, right? So last week I got an email in my inbox that was uh, from quote unquote McAfee. <laughs> it said, hey, Boyan, here is your McAfee, you know, uh, invoice for the next year. It's $600. If you feel that this was, uh, this is erroneous, please call this phone number. And it had my name, it had my address. It had specific information about the type of computer that I even use, right? And, and so I'm thinking like, man, an AI must have written this because there was just enough contextual information in that email to me that like made me actually open it, right? I didn't obviously call the number because I, I knew it was phishing or I knew it was a scam, but lots of people would right and this is becoming a, a really big problem so this number is in inclusive of all scams and all that type of stuff and i think what hackers have just figured out is like hey with 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 a simple api call i can create a perfectly crafted message for whatever scam i'm running to a specific individual and so that way you know this is a, a massive um bump in in the number of emails going out and you know i think I think before ChatGPT, maybe my spam filter would have caught that type of email because it would have not have been specific enough to me. Yeah, you know, the one thing I will put on this number is it is cited that it is their mid, this is slash next mid-year assessment of 2024. So this isn't even much more than what we're nine months deep. So we'll, when we take an assessment of what we're going to see in 25 and we look back on 24 as a whole, all the things that you brought up, boy, on is the wide range of malicious emails, how much are phishing? Because that is a 
going to be obviously what's going to have the most fruit. But the scammer, the, the scammer side, I think having proper language, because we've been saying this for, I think, at least a year since GVT kind of started hitting it, is that this is all going to be clean text, right? It's all going to be clean context of emails now yeah. without grammar challenges. Um, and it's just going to perfectly. I don't, I don't, I don't see it slowing down. So if we were to bring up, okay, what's the negative of LLMs coming to market? The negative is that this has happened. What's the positive? We have a solution, man. <laughs> hey, there's already a solution for the phishing part, for the phishing authentication. That the tech is there. Um, just to kind of kick back Crouch, right? Or the Falcon. I'm like, look, this isn't a tech problem. This is just a, a business and, and people problem that we can solve. It, it's it not many times can we have a solution on ready for these type of uh situations. And it's it's pretty amazing that we have one, I I believe, already ready to go. Yeah, on the next slide, we have a stat from the same report, I believe, that's specifically around phishing. Uh, and, and so this was crazy to me that 850% yeah. increase in phishing attacks in the last 12 months. And, and this is, you know, I've, I brought this point up before where the industry used to differentiate between phishing and spear phishing. Right? And now there's no reason to make that a differentiation anymore because that kind of spray and pray approach that hackers used to have, they don't need to do that anymore, right? And because now they can create highly contextualized, highly relevant phishing campaigns to individuals to primarily steal credentials. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's what we see happening. So this this is a little bit more targeted, Andrew, right? It's not the, yeah. the 4,100, 4, but I mean, an increase in malicious emails overall in our inboxes but yeah. now at least we have a, a just an astronomical number on phishing <laughs> numbers versus just malicious. It's still a huge increase. This is this is a pretty solid number as well. No, this speaks to that problem. Yeah, so this is it's a very solid increase. It's not forty one times, but it's eight and a half times, um, which is staggering. And but going to your point, it's not just volume that they're better. Um, they're more sophisticated. Right. And, and so like, like Ryan, like you said, we've been talking about this for a year now. So, you know, people are able to deliver, you know, perfectly worded phishing emails in any language to people all over the world and bring them to a pixel perfect knockoff of a website. And so fish, I mean, phishing works. It worked before that. I mean, spear phishing had a, had a great success rate um, because things look real and, and, and human nature is to trust. Um, and so that's why it's really important that we put tools in place to protect users from themselves because, you know, in, inside the workforce, I don't believe it should be your employees jobs to be a shadow IT team to try to snuff out phishing attacks, right? They should be focused on their day jobs. Um, and when, you know, the enterprise or workforce deploys, you know, FIDO authentication and moves away from pass keys, that's exactly what happens. Um, it allows that you know, the workers to, to do their jobs and allows the IT team to do theirs and, and then focus on other threats other than, uh, credential phishing, which is still a, a, a the leading threat vector out there today. Yeah, so much of it is is you know one of the things I've seen recently with phishing and, and even social engineering, we I've seen a lot of organizations move any sort of credential related um, support issue to the security security operation control center. It's the SOC. And, you know, so what, you, you know, typically for credential related issues, it would go to a IT help desk, which has been optimized for cost effectiveness, right? Meaning it's typically somebody in a different country that costs a lot less. Um, but now that they're moving more of these credential related issues into the SOC, these are highly paid, highly skilled individuals now dealing with credential resets. And all of a sudden it becomes a major cost center to the business. Uh, because of the accuracy and the sophistication of these attacks and obviously the, the increased rate. So I think uh, on the next slide, we have some questions around strategic value to organizations of moving to, uh, to passkeys in particular and, and modernizing the way that they do authentication and access. Um, but one of the things I'd like to get your thoughts on Andrew, on Andrew is like, you know, we like to talk about this type of stuff all day long from a security perspective and a usability perspective. But what have you seen resonate with the C-suite 
at these companies in terms of getting them to move towards pass keys? Yeah, so I, I think for, I mean, if you're talking about it in employee authentication um, and workforce authentication, I mean, it's very much about you know, threat mitigation. Um, you know, I enjoyed earlier this year, um, I had a, a keynote um, at Identiverse and we, we had a panel discussion and um, I brought with me the, the head of authentication from Bank of America. And he, the, the most important thing that he said is that he could sleep at night, right? So he knows that since he's taken passwords out of play, they've moved, you know, I think 95% of their global workforce away from passwords and moving to FIDO-based solutions. He knows that's the next big social engineering attack that happens, that he doesn't need to wake up in the middle of the night to worry about that, right? So it's peace of mind and knowing that your employees are um, protected. Um, and that your, your your system resources and networks protected from these attacks that continue to, to, to grow in volume. Um, when I talked to the C-suite about deploying pass keys for consumers, um, a couple of KPIs always come to mind. You know, generally people want to have a higher signing success rate and a quicker time to sign in, which is you know, throughput basically. Um, and they're, they're finding that, right? So there's a, the, the ease of use and the usability of pass keys um, is helping facilitate commerce. So again, that, that same keynote discussion I had about a gentleman uh, from Amazon who reported, I believe it was around a 14% increase in sign-in success rate um, versus other forms of authentication. That's a huge number to be able to increase your sign-in success by you know over by double digits for a company of that size. Um, you know, that, that's that's meaningful revenue opportunity. And then the last thing there on that front is that. You know, I'm hearing more and more um, people report back that they're, they're, they're starting to draw a direct line uh, between the increase um, in, increased percentage of con- customers using pass keys and decreased in fraud uh, because account takeovers are decreasing, um, you know, things like that. So it's, it's really, you know, top line opportunity, you know, bottom line savings and just better security and hygiene. Uh, for the workforce. Yeah, it's interesting. We, uh, I was at the, um, I was at a conference a few weeks ago in in Charlotte, North Carolina, all around financial fraud. And one of the participants, one of the audience members, mentioned that they had deployed pass keys to their consumers, and they were an insurance company. And they said they saw about a fifty percent increase in login success mm. for for those people who had adopted pass keys. And, and they were only at about 15% adoption at that point, I believe, but still a measurable impact. And it was, it, it made me think like in those applications where people log in less frequently, like insurance, yes. you're probably going to have more success because you know people are using that credential far less frequently and people forget passwords when they don't use them. Absolutely. So the lower volume, lower frequency sign-in is a great use case for pass keys, but it's also, you know, it's not just about sign-in success. That means there's less recovery processes being run, right? And, and account recovery, that's, you know, prime grounds for social engineering, social engineers calling the help desk and, and um, manipulating people to take over accounts. So staying out of those flows um, has the added security benefit as well. Yeah. So a quick question on, um, uh, on, on, uh, since we're at the C-suite, let's talk about the CISO in particular. Uh, quick thoughts on, on, on how passkeys can help companies with their zero trust strategies. Is that for Ryan or me? Uh, let's, let's go with Ryan first and then you can uh, chime in as well. Well, I, I can pontificate forever on this specific topic. Well, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, kind of narrow it down to some degree. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, you point on you and I have the same conversation. Like zero trust is based off of zero passwords, right? Um, everybody can have their three or four pillars. If you truly want to have that strategy, and let's really call it a zero trust strategy or initiative, have effect and and follow least privilege and all these other kind of models that are associated with zero zero trust. How do you how do you implement something that has phishing? deficits in it to be zero trust. Technically, I don't think you can have a true zero trust program unless you have phishing resistant authentication, which would be pass keys deployed. Um, that should just be more or less your incremental 
progress as you're taking on this initiative because people are going to be doing things like deploying sassies and all these other you know vendors and all these other security tools along the way just start incrementing pass keys into your your user base um, which should be a, a cornerstone of the identity pillar under under zero trust keeping it high level because we could talk about this one topic i think for for an hour and a half alone uh, so I'll leave it to you, Andrew. If you, if you no, want to I, add I totally agree, and that, 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 that's similar to, to what I'm hearing. And, and I think, um, look, I, it, I'm not trying to trivialize, you know, what what the lift may be um, to to you know get rid of your to, to stop depending on passwords, right? So this is not about password lists. It's really about less passwords. Um, less passwords is the way the path to password lists. Um, but you know, companies need to take those first steps, um, and and and. Obviously, companies like you know, partners like Hyper can certainly you know, work with companies to help them um, help them you know identify a, a path towards uh, maybe it's taking some segments of employees off uh, passwords right away and moving others over time. Um, but those first steps are critical, and 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 I agree also. Like it's it's, it's hard to imagine a zero trust and effective zero trust trust architecture where you still have where you're still relying on knowledge based credentials. At, at, at its foundation. Um, so yeah, passkeys I think are a way to help accelerate um, zero trust implementations. Yeah, I think even the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, you know, has a maturity model with regards to zero trust, and and you know you can't really get into that advanced or optimal stage without a phishing resistant authentication method deployed. And so, really, anything outside of that is is uh, considered legacy. Which is which is really refreshing to see. I think our next uh, set of questions on the following slide are all about how do you balance usability along with security, right? And so, one of the questions that we have recently come across and, and were asked were, um, you know, give a high level overview of, of how pass keys can prevent the uh, attacks of like man in the middle. Uh, and we've seen tools like Evil Gen X being used to intercept credentials. Um, Andrew, if you want to go first, or Ryan, uh, how how can how can these things be uh, prevented? I mean, fundamentally, you know, when there's no knowledge based credential to steal, it, it, it takes away that that threat entirely. Um, you know, and that's that's what FIDO is doing, and, and it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, when I give a talk and show the FIDO security model and, and, the, and the flow, the FIDO authentication flow, that hasn't changed <laughs> in 12 something years, right? I mean, Brian, you said you've been focused on this, you know, for the longest of any job you've had. You've been, this is the same model we've had all along, right? And, and so it's, it's user friendly, asymmetric public key cryptography, um, you know, which I could barely say when I first started talking about it, but <laughs> now I, I, I whisper it in my sleep. Uh, no, but it's, a, it's the same model. And, and but fundamentally, what we're doing is, is you know, allowing the authenticator to mediate the authentication journey or the, 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 the ceremony. So instead of having something that only you know, quote unquote, in air quotes, on a server, now it's a it's a it's a key pair. Right? So the public key sits on the server, the private key sits um, on the device, and and it's that encrypted communication between those two things that allows someone to be signed in securely. And there's no way for a you know man in the middle attack machine in the middle attack to to work because one of those two components won't be there. Um, so even if someone is duped into you know, trying to sign in, they can't. And um, that's the beauty of it all. And that's why. And then that's again that's that has not changed. Um, the only thing that has you know has been modified, you know, with the advent of pass keys is it is the ability for that private key, which used to have to be enrolled for every device for every service, that private key can now be securely synchronized across a a, uh, a credential provider cloud. So whether it's an operating system cloud like a you know I iCloud or you know Chrome, or whether it's a third-party credential manager like a One Password or Dashlane, you know those folks can now manage the passkey so that it's readily available across all your devices. And that's a very that's a really um, strong usability uh, boost. And it's something that I believe we believe, and, and what we've seen through the results bear out that that was holding back deployments of, of FIDO at scale for consumer applications. Yeah, it's also a massive benefit, right? So one of the, one, the way I talk about it is like, hey, if the user is ever type, typing in a credential at any point in time, 
chances are it's not FIDO based. <laughs> chances are it's not using yeah. a passkey, so yeah. it should be avoided. Uh, and two is just how how big of an asset passkeys can be in terms of that uh, new device situation, right? Millions of people are going to get the new iPhone when it yeah. comes out. They're going to download their apps on their new phone, and when they open up that app, they're probably going to be they're probably going to be asked to type in a password. With a passkey, you don't have to have that in any situation anymore because whenever that occurs, a portion of those people being asked to type in a password probably haven't typed it in since the last time they got a new phone, which was a year ago. And a good percentage of them are probably going to pick up the phone and call the IT service desk, which has a hard cost associated with it. So if you can just eliminate that entire usability nightmare, you know, we have uh, we have customers of ours who used to refer to this as a password Armageddon, you know, because they have tens of millions of customers and they would find themselves in a situation where, you know, whenever the new iPhone is coming out, they would hire on additional IT support people like seasonal workers at, you know, Walmart or something to just deal with password resets. That's amazing. And, uh, and so if that entire set of concerns can virtually be eliminated, it's a massive win to the business. So that's for uh, enterprises with BYOD authentication for people around on no, there. Even consumer. Yeah. Right. Consumer, because, uh, you know, f for a lot of, uh, for a lot of banking applications in particular, you yeah, know, you, you can't sure. do credential reset through email, right? That, sure. Cause they, they kind of assume that your email is compromised. Yeah. It's the, it's the thundering herd analogy come password on good, right? Like it's everybody's getting the new device, uh, and everybody's making phone calls. So yeah, the, the interesting thing is, is that we keep hearing the balancing of security and usability. This is, it's one thing I kind of, it's been the security conversation that we've had for ever since I've been in the authentication space. It's, it's been a, a key cornerstone. I think it's through education that users will become comfortable and educated. Like the, the adoption of passkeys is actually going to be manifested, I believe, in the same way that many got used to using SMS as a second factor. These bigger services, Google, Apple, Microsoft, in our consumer day-to-day -day lives will get most users primed to this new way. And through some of our work, obviously, the enterprises internally will have some experiences. And I think the moment anybody uses a passkey to authenticate, there yeah. is no more conversation about usability. Is this, we're, we're having these conversations because it's the unknown for many. Um, and I think that the security is is just written in. We, we, get, we get the security that we need to solve the first couple of topics that we were just talking about. There is no other technology that has been implemented or deployed in my 20 plus years that has made such a significant impact to a threat. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one of our customers rolled out passkeys, and for those users where they enforced passkeys, they had a 98.5% reduction in account takeover fraud. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> like, I mean, like that's, that's it, it, sound, it sounds like an unbelievable statistic, but when yeah. you eliminate the credential theft as a, as a vector, it, yeah. it really does that. Um, so w we have a couple of minutes here. Uh, we do have a slide uh, on navigating passkey adoption that we can just run through real quick because people had asked like, hey, like, what are the things I need to uh, uh, look out for here? So we'll pick on a couple of these and talk about them really quickly and then we'll wrap it up. But the one that I think is is more important than most is have a plan for legacy systems. There's so many instances where we see organizations who are so excited to roll out pass keys. They're so excited to go passwordless, but then there's that one person in the room that's like, well, what about our AS 400s? You know, and, and it's like, okay, let's keep using passwords for those for the time being. Okay. We yeah. can put that inside our privileged access management system or whatever else. But for everything else, the 99.9% .9 of other login situations, we can still roll out a more modern phishing resistant authentication method that people actually like. Yeah, that's, that's, that's absolutely critical. And I think that's the right perspective to have also. Um, the other one of these bullets I think is really important is you know, clear communication and guidance. Um, so education, 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 right? So if you're, if you're moving a workforce over to pass keys, 
Um, you need to explain why and, and how and, and what they should expect. And you need to have your internal IT teams ready. Um, obviously, for introducing passkeys to your consumers, you know, you need to have your customer support folks ready. You need to explain, like we, we actually, in our design guidelines, uh, we're very explicit and very prescriptive, actually, about the best way to introduce passkeys to consumers. And that's based on data. Uh, that you know, we've done a lot of research on this front uh, to see you know what messages land most with consumers, what questions do they have, how do you head those off, and so all of that's been rolled into the the, the Fido design guidelines that we have, um, which includes this this piece on on education and communication, which is absolutely critical. Yeah, I remember the exact same concerns being raised back in 2014 when the iPhone 5s came out with the fingerprint reader. And we were sitting there talking about like, how are we going to get people to want to use fingerprint based authentication to log into apps? You know, and, and there was so much thought uh, that went into it and, and guidance and data gathered. And eventually, you know, it, it just got to a point of critical mass where the consumer started asking, why don't you support this? I'm literally going to use your competitor if you don't. Yes. And uh, I, I think I think in the next year or two, we're going to get there with pass keys as well, for sure. Ryan, you got a favorite on this list? Well, I'm definitely not ever going to do this with you guys again and let you go first and then you go second. <laughs> you guys stealing the ones that I'm going with. I have but it, I mean, more to choose from. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think if uh, if we tie it back, I mean, it is map out the use cases, right? Enterprises are complex. Apps are complex. Uh, sit down and jot down what your, what your apps are. I mean, if you're going through a zero trust strategy, if you're going through those things, you need to have an outline and some of us have seen the world of application sprawl identity sprawl there is a point in time we have to bring this back in and we have to kind of rein it in and then i think that then feeds into the following bullet points that you guys were discussing as well i think like what i was hearing most is let's let's educate let's enable let's let's plan accordingly and then we can execute um once again, I will advocate. The technology is already there. This is just an implementation and adoption uh, scenario that we're in in my book. Yeah, one of my favorite things is like, you know, with, with something like passwordless or pass keys, right? Whenever, as technologists, whenever we're rolling out new stuff, we tend to first put it into the hands of the most technical audience. Well, as techies, like the favorite thing we do, we like to do is shoot holes in whatever's put in front of us. Right, like, so what we actually have seen be really successful within enterprises, at least, is, um, in particular, roll this out to your non-technical users. Give it to your HR folks. Give it to the folks in accounting. See what they think, and they are they're they're far less likely to sit there and try to look for every little flaw in every little edge case, and they're more likely to just say, "Hey, this is making me more effective as an employee. It's making me more productive." Um, so it's really, it's a really interesting, um, dynamic. I think there was a question around, does passwordless with Hyper still require dependency for enterprises to integrate with their directory as so an identity administrator? With Hyper, yes. Um, Hyper does authentication into your existing identity stores. And this is one of those topics where I think it kind of aligns to the top bullet here, which is map out use cases. I think there was another statistic recently that said, the average enterprise manages a person's identity in 25 different places. That means you potentially have to worry about authentication into 25 different systems. And so what we really focus on here at Hyper is how do we make sure that you have a horizontal plane of authentication that is consistent and secure across all your identity stores. Uh, so that's really where we we focus on the secure and and broad integration across IDPs, operating systems, and all these other um, downstream dependencies that a typical identity environment has. But I think that is uh, that is it for today. I think we're way past time as usual. Uh, Andrew, thank you again for joining yeah. us. Thanks for having me. Um, everybody, please, if you haven't already, sign up for Authenticate uh, here in about three weeks in beautiful Carlsbad. It is terrific. I recommend you bring a significant other or your family with you. Uh, I made the mistake of not doing that last time <laughs> and uh, doing FaceTime calls with like beautiful palm trees behind me and everybody being like, hey, what the hell? <laughs> so, 
we do also, I mean, not, I mean, you're, we're selling the in, in-person experience because it is so awesome, but you can also attend remotely. So if you can't travel or if you have a newborn on the way or something like that, you need to attend at home, <laughs> you certainly can do. Um, yes. And so those who register remotely get access to the content. We'll, we'll eventually make all the content available, but there's a several months lag on that. So there's a lot of value actually to seeing these case studies and these, these uh, ex, you know, tutorials. Um, so you can always, you can access it remotely as well if you need to. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely, definitely come visit because it would be great to see everybody at Authenticate as well as uh, if you're catching this on YouTube, please like, subscribe, throw some comments, give us some ideas on content uh, as well as for the LinkedIn uh, audience there. If you you got comments, if you guys have ideas on other topics that would, we'll, you know, we already have a set schedule, but we're open for, for anything that's new and fun in the world of cybersecurity. So uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks. Appreciate it. See you. Okay.